Good morning. Pastor Jim's message this morning is based in part on our scripture lesson from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are fifty righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for, this, for their sake. Then Abraham spoke, spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the, if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find forty-five there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only forty are found there? He said, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only thirty can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty here. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only twenty can be found there? He said, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. Thanks Tyler, for reading the scriptures today. I I think you read it before me the last time I spoke, so I appreciate Maybe we're a good tag team. Well, uh, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. If this is your first time with us, uh, special thanks for you to be here. Uh, David and the choir, I, I want to say it was my first experience to uh, see the tribute you did for those who served in the armed forces, and I think it's a commendable thing that you do. Um, we appreciate that recognition, and so thank you for that. Uh, for the last uh, month around here, we've been going through a church-wide study. It's called Reality, the Seven Truths to Experiencing God. And uh, we're coming about to the end of it. Next weekend, we'll wrap it up. And if you've been following along with the weekly uh, devotional guide, maybe going to a small group throughout the week and coming here each weekend, then you're, you're pretty uh, certain where we are and uh, maybe where we're headed. And so today's message, which if you notice the title, Radical Adjustment, makes some sense to you because you've seen this diagram every week, sometimes uh, almost every day in your devotional guide. And so you know where we are in the process, that this is the week we're supposed to about, talk about the adjustment that we need to make if we're going to follow where God's leading. So, so hopefully that uh, you know, gives you some sense of what, where we're headed, but you might be confused. How does that relate to what we just heard from Genesis 18? You're probably a little bit of a, you know, that doesn't seem to fit. Well, that's okay. It kind of puts all of us on the same uh, playing field. We're, we're all confused. 
And so for a number of reasons, some of you, you haven't been here for this uh, study. You've had personal conflicts, or, or like I mentioned, uh, you're new, and uh, you're just checking us out today. And, you know, you're not, you're not sure where we're going, let alone if you're even going to come back. And so all the more reason to do a little bit of review about where we've been and make sure this is a really good message. So uh, um, the, what we've covered thus far is uh, pretty straightforward. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty, um, you know, they're not confusing or complex truths. God's always at work. He's always pursuing. He's always inviting. He's always speaking. Last week we talked about as you start hearing God speak to you, saying what he wants to do, it, it sounds exciting initially, but then it can become a little challenging. You think, well, do I really want to do what he says? And that creates a, a crisis of faith. When God invites you into something, what do I really believe about him? What do I believe about myself? Now, we've been trying to frame this entire series uh, in the life of Abraham. Not only does the Bible tell us to do so, to look at Abraham as our guide, as our model in the faith, but more than that, what God invited Abraham into is connected to what God's inviting us into. I want to let that statement sink in just a little bit to you. And then try to remind you of what the big plan of God is. What is this Bible, this book that's in your lap? What's it all about? Because in many ways, the story got started with Abraham. And it's been continuing right down through the ages, right up until today. And someday, God will bring it to completion, to culmination, when the full extent of God's divine agenda will finally be realized. You know, contrary to popular belief, History is going somewhere because it is his story. And these current days we're living in, they're like chapters in God's great novel. And we get to be a part of it if we choose, if we accept his invitation and make the necessary changes to be used by him. And that change is what I'm calling a radical adjustment. Now, before we see what makes it so radical, let's remember, well, what was it that God wanted Abraham to do? What did he want to do in and through him, and what does he want to continue with us? We heard it mentioned in the passage that was read this morning, and it's repeated so many times in the Scriptures, and yet still we just, you know, overlook it. Here it is again, Genesis 18. Listen to it. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Do you hear what God's saying here? Now, how many nations are on the earth today? Anybody want to make a guess? I Googled it, you know, maybe some of you are Googling it right now, you know, but there, there's 195 countries. But if you start thinking about people groups and ethnic cultures, you know, not just geopolitical uh, designations, the number is well over 10,000. So let me ask you, are those quote-unquote nations being blessed? And if not, why not? Didn't God say all nations on the earth would be blessed through Abraham? Yeah, about a dozen times in the Old and New Testament. So what's the problem? Well, how's this blessing program supposed to continue? Well, it's through Abraham and his children and his children's children, so on and so forth. Who are Abraham's children? Father Abraham and many sons. So what does that mean? I am one of them and so are you. If you know the scriptures, Galatians 3 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So this is the family business you and I have been invited into. The heritage that's been passed down to us from our forefathers. The agenda of God that we're supposed to be carrying out. Making sure the nations the various and diverse people, groups, sects, and tribes are being blessed. But what does that mean? That's you. Oh, bless you. Is that it? That we just got to go around just saying that? We, we toss that word out all the time. 
But what constitutes this blessing from God? What gift, what favor or kindness does God give to us that he wants us to be engaged in making sure others received? Well, this story from Genesis 18 really is the whole Blackaby series in one setting. If you've missed any parts of this series, you can get it all today. Just This is like the condensed Reader's Digest version. Here it is. All the parts are right here. God's been working in the world. We know that from Genesis 1 right up until 18. He's active on the earth. He's pursuing this relationship with Abram. And now in this passage comes this invitation. Maybe a little indirect, but this is exactly what God is doing. He's inviting Abraham's intervention into what he's considering doing. Listen again to verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom. Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. You, you do this, right? You, you walk your guests to the door when they're leaving. He's doing the same thing. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Now, when you tease somebody like that, right, when you say, hey, well, should we tell them about that? Well, as soon as you do, right, their ears perk up. Well, tell me. I want to hear, right? That this is what God's doing. He's setting up a moment to invite Abraham into it. He's creating an opportunity for dialogue. Now, what had happened before this section that we didn't read is that God and two little heavenly men showed up. I, I don't know why they were little, but they probably were big. And they, they show up to Abraham's tent, and they tell him that next year, Sarah's going to give birth to a son. Now, they had heard the promise many times, but this time they put a timetable on it and made sure they get it right that Sarah's going to have the baby because, you know, that Hagar thing we dealt with last week, that's not going to be a good thing. Well, it must sound ridiculous because Sarah laughs at it. You know, fat chance. This was like, you know, LOL, laugh out loud. There's no way, God, this is going to happen. And God hears her laughing and says, you know, you laughed. You thought it was funny. And she said, no, I, I didn't. And God says, well, look, you name the kid laughter then. That's what the word Isaac means, laughter. So that you will never forget that God did something you didn't think he could do. Do you, do you have anything in your life? that you can look at again and again and say, I never thought he'd do that, but he did. And it reminds me year after year of his faithfulness, that God can do the impossible. I hope you have something like that. I certainly do. For me, every time I look at my kids, I got a little picture of them. I, maybe I don't. But boom, there they are. Yeah, this is many years ago, obviously. But uh, Beth and I had 15 years of infertility and yet we did an international adoption with Gabriel, and that was a miraculous story. And then, two years later, Andrea was born, the old-fashioned way. And so every time I look at my kids, I'm reminded of what God can do. Well, the whole point of this visit by God and these, and these angelic beings seems like it was just another affirmation of the promise to Abraham. Because at this point, God's been blessing him just like he said he would. Abraham's well-known in the community. He's got a thriving business. And he's quite wealthy. The only thing left is to have an heir, and God shows up telling him, hey, you're going to have a child. The question that's in our minds that ought to be is, well, God said he was going to bless Abraham so he would be a blessing to others. When's that going to start happening? Everything we read in Genesis seems like the focus is always on Abraham's agenda, his wants and desires. I, I went through all the prayers of Abraham, every conversation the Bible records of God and Abraham, and the focus is always, Bless me, Lord. You know, bless my business, my family, my friends, you know, my, my future. It's all me. Never once does Abraham say, bless those outside my circle. Never once are the nations, these people around him, ever on his radar, ever on his concern, where he's wanting to secure that they have a blessing like he has had. This is the very thing God's called him to do. The very reason God's made his life so good is so that he would extend that goodness to others. That's the righteousness and justice that he's supposed to be doing for others. When's that going to happen? Up until this moment, it has never happened. Not even once. But now it does. What looked like this gathering with God that day was going to end with the same focus it does every Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and bring you peace, right? Because it's all about you. But not this time. 
This time, God invites Abraham in to what he's thinking of doing. And what happens next is a dialogue between Abraham and God of the likes we have never seen before. Verse 20, then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will come down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Do you see what's happening here? God's creating a moment. He's opening a door. He's just told Abraham that he's thinking about bringing judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, but he needs to first go down and see and make sure that things are right. Well, obviously God didn't come down to find out what was going on. He already knew. He came down because he's opened up the door for Abraham. What's he going to do when he hears this statement? Now, before we address what Abraham did, Let's uh, talk about a subject that might be rolling around in your own heads as you hear this idea of God judging. You might be uncomfortable saying, well, you know, I believe in a God of love, a God who shows mercy. And I hear that. I understand how this could be a stumbling block for some. But consider this. The word outcry here that's repeated a couple of times in this passage is a very specific word in the Old Testament, and it's used to depict the plea the cry of those who are oppressed or violated, those who are abused, those who are suffering under cruelty, violence, and injustice. Because that's exactly what was happening in this region. This area called the Salt Valley had become so wealthy that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had become so uh, indulgent, so, you know, their focus was only their own appetites and pleasures, that they became cruel and hard-hearted toward others. Listen to how the prophet ex describes the sin of Sodom. This is Ezekiel 16. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, the other cities around her, had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. And she did not help the poor and needy. So let me ask you, what kind of God would have neglected the cries of those people being oppressed. If he didn't make right those wrongs, do you think you'd have a good God? Is that mercy to allow wickedness to continue? So often we pit these concepts against each other in such simplistic ways, and yet the Bible declares that God is both just and merciful, and this story tells us something about his character and our role to step in and see mercy come to others. Because when Abraham hears God saying, I'm thinking about bringing judgment, he doesn't say, well, God, you're sovereign. You're going to do whatever you want to do. You know, I mean, it's going to be rough on those people, but hey, I got to get back home and get to that baby making because, wow, in a year we're going to have a kid, right? He didn't say that. Listen to what he does. He starts praying. He starts interceding. He starts bargaining with God. He goes to bat for who? The people of Sodom and Gomorrah. These Canaanites, the, these selfish, self-centered people. He stands in the gap for them. Look at how he approaches God, the, the argument that he uses. Then Abraham approached God and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 people in the city? 50 righteous. Will, will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham begins what I would call a crucial conversation. He, he's mediating. He's appealing for mercy for these people. Now, do you notice Abraham's not asking that his family be spared. That's what a lot of us might be thinking, you know, because he's got relatives there. Remember Lot and his wife and the daughters? You think, hey, could you get my family? Could you separate my family out before you bring that judgment? That's not what he's asking. He's asking that you spare the whole. This is the radical adjustment God's been waiting for. 
All the blessings that have been coming to Abraham's life has been so that he would be a blessing to other people. He'd finally start being concerned about others to be blessed like he's been blessed. And what does that mean? To be spared, to be forgiven, to be saved. Now let me ask you, what do you call a person who intercedes on behalf of another? What do you call a person who intercedes to God on behalf of others? They're called a priest, right? This is Abraham's first priestly act. This is the radical adjustment. When you see yourself as a priest, as someone who takes up the spiritual concerns of others, when your heart is more focused on compassion than condemnation, when you're more interested in being a blessing than receiving a blessing, when you make the necessary adjustment, that's when it's... A, it's essential adjustment for you to experience God. And I think we can take some lessons from Abraham here, his, his approach and his appeal. Notice how he focuses on God's character. Hey, God, this isn't like you. This isn't who you are. We're not the judge of all the earth. Do right. Your reputation, your fame is at stake. Moses did the same thing, right? You remember times when Moses said, hey, God, what will people think of you? The psalmist spoke this way. Jesus used it. They leveraged what God said of who he is, what he's like to influence his plans. But Abraham does something else. He plums the depths of righteousness. He wants to know how efficacious, how effective righteousness is. You know, how much righteousness is needed to cover the sins of so many? Can the righteousness of a few save the many. That, that's the question he wants to answer. You know, can we assuage the judgment of God? Look, we, we all pray for our kids, our friends, and our family. You know, the people we like to hang out with. Those are the ones we invite to church. You know, we think, hey, it'd be good to have them around. Maybe business partners, maybe even meet my kids and get married. That, that, those are good people, right? What about the other people? Everybody's got another group. The ones we rarely consider their plight before holy God. We rarely think about interceding for them. What about them? Abraham is becoming a priest. A priest to the nations. To a mixed group. Some good and a whole lot not, right? And still he's pleading for mercy to them because God has invited him into this opportunity. This is what it means to be a blessing to the nations, to intercede on their behalf, to care about them experiencing what we so much enjoy, God's blessing. And so Abraham, you heard how he, he was like an auctioneer, you know, can I give me 50, 50, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, all the way down, right? And think, he wants to know, you know, how much righteousness will cause God to spare the unrighteousness? Well, when someone stands before holy God, can the righteousness of a few cover the unrighteousness of the many? When you stand before the judge of all the earth, can the merits of another credit to your debt? You're going to stand there on your own thinking, okay, that's all I got is what I've done, and that's not going to be enough, right? Now, Moses, or Abraham, went all the way down to ten. He said, hey, if there's just ten, will you uh, not, not judge? And God says, I, I won't. You know, I think I would have probably stopped a lot sooner than this. But why did he stop at 10? How much do you think? How much righteousness does there need to be before God will not bring judgment? This, this story tells us so much about God and his desire to spare judgment. The more and more I read and thought about this passage, I think this is God's heart. He wants to assuage his judgment that's why he invited Abraham into it. He wants Abraham pleading for others, asking for their mercy to come to them because God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And you know what? God doesn't stop at 10. He goes all the way down to 1. That's right. The righteousness of one person offers salvation for the many. Right here in this gospel story, in this uh, Old Testament story, we see a picture of the gospel. The act of righteousness of Jesus, right? The one 
Romans 5 says, So as through one transgression there resulted in condemnation to all, so through even one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. This is how everyone is saved. It is never on the basis of your righteousness alone. You always need the righteousness of another, the righteousness of one. And the Bible describes Jesus as our priest, the one who intercedes the holy God on our behalf, who appeals to us, to God, for our righteousness because of what he's done. Do you see what's happening in this story? It's a story of God's justice and righteousness, about our involvement for prayer and mercy. So what's lacking? What's missing here? It's more Abrahams, right? It's his descendants following in the pattern that he laid out here. It's this work continuing. It's keeping the family business going. It's you and me having our own radical adjustment where we're willing to get involved, engaged, even inconvenienced for the spiritual condition of others. Where our shift is no longer just about enjoying our blessing. We're so grateful for God for all that you've done for us, right? But we're more focused on extending that blessing. That we become priests. And we're praying for others. We're building a bridge with others. We're in, taking them before God and bringing them to God because this is the heart of God for us. I've been fellowshipping with this church for almost a year now. And one doctrine that I've heard over and over again, it's called the priesthood of all believers. This is a core belief in the Presbyterian church, that the priests aren't only the guys that stand up front here and look kind of good, kind of good, you know, but it's every one of us. When we take the concern, the spiritual concern of individuals before holy God, we are carrying out our priesthood. This is what 1 Peter says. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How do we do that? Around here, you know, I think there's three fundamental ways you do it. Worship, witness, and works. And I'd say around here, you work. Did you hear all the opportunities to serve coming up at Christmas time? It's, it's exhausting around you. You guys are blessing all kinds of families through your works and worship. Wonderful play, way, play, way we worship here on the weekends. But one of the things we've been praying and talking about is how does God want to extend it even further? How does he want to make sure that our work and witness adds words of the gospel message? And we're not just taking care of the body, but the soul. That we're concerned about people's spiritual condition before holy God. How do we extend that message to others? You want it to your kids? Yeah. I want it to my friends and neighbors. How about the people that we don't think that much about? This is the heart of God. This is the adjustment that has to happen inside of us. And so one idea, I'm sure you've heard rolling around, Pastor Malcolm mentioned it last week, was taking the contemporary service that we've been doing on Saturday nights and moving it to Sunday mornings. Moving it at a prime time when more people could have access to hear of this God who desires to save. But that requires an adjustment on our parts, right? 930 service, look around, it's pretty full. Have you seen the parking lot at 930? Let's have another service at 930. Who's doing the math? Where are we going to park? <laughs> it's going to require an adjustment. How are you going to handle the hallways? And what about more kids in the children's program? And the list goes on and on. This is a radical adjustment. It requires a heart that says, I'm more interested in being a blessing than receiving a blessing. But if we're going to experience what God's doing, we've got to make a step and a change. And all the relationships you have, God's calling you to be a priest to that person. Sometimes you're the only one in their lives who would pray for them. Do you pray for them? Do you even think about their spiritual condition? This is what happened with Abraham. This is what needs to happen to us. This is God's desire and heart. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Malcolm to come up. You, maybe when you came in this morning, you picked up a card. Uh, did, uh, you, I have some extra ones. 
Who didn't get one of these cards? If you just raise your hand, and I think the ushers are going to come in. They've got some. Jim's going to come out. Maybe you can draft somebody to pass them out with you. Now, if you've got this card, just pull it out. I want you to look at it real quick. Okay, Tyler, can you help Jim pass some of these out? That'd be great. Um, you'll look at it and you'll say, contemporary service. Well, why do I need this card? Because I go to the traditional service. And we're not asking you to quit going to the traditional service to go to the contemporary service. Um, what we are saying is this is an opportunity for us to, not, to, 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 to make this adjustment where what we're focused on is doing for ourselves. Now we want to be able to do and reach further and broader to reach out. And so there are some ways that you can support. You can put your name, phone, email on here. And, uh, and then there's a couple ways. Number one is we need people praying for this service. Many of you I know are faithful in prayer every single day. If you'd be willing to pray that God would use this new service that has a new language, kind of try to reach people who aren't already connected here. Um, if you'd be willing to pray for that to prosper every day, then check that box and put your name down. Jim, we need at least one more over here, I know. Maybe they're coming down the pews. Second opportunity is uh, you may want to serve on one of the teams to launch this service. You can still come to this service, but we need people working around the services, greeting teams, parking teams. Uh, we need a team to be, of, of people that are going to set up and tear down because we're doing this in the gym. Um, the gym's not set up for worship. We need a team that's going to work on outreach. Maybe you'd be willing to be in leadership because you got this message. You want to see other people be reached for Jesus Christ. And then the last uh, opportunity is maybe you're able to make a one-time gift uh, to support this. Again, we're going to be doing this in the gym, which feels like a gym. And, uh, and, and we'd like it to be a, a, a worship space. Now, we did this eight years ago, uh, nine years ago, and, and it was pretty good, but it's been a long time since then. We've got some work that we need to do there uh, to make it a place that we can set up that's going to be really inducive, uh, conducive to worship. So maybe you can do one of those. So prayerfully consider whether or not God would have you who are blessed with this church, this service, to be a blessing that others too might connect with Jesus Christ. Um, we'll pick these up at the door. Just hand them to an usher, hand them to one of the pastors. After you've filled them out, that would be great. Thanks, Jim. You know, every uh, week we end... Uh, the sermon by saying the Lord's Prayer. What an amazing prayer, right? That God's kingdom, that His will that's done in heaven would be done here on earth. We have an opportunity, just a small way, to see more of that a reality here. Do you not think that would thrill the heart of God? Let's be a part of that. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.